going to talk about how I followed this, this um, debate and discussion for, well, since my first experience with psychedelics, which would have been in 1991, and why I've always seen it as a political, um, coinciding with political movements. So I was born in 1967, 50 years ago. Of course, a lot of people have been discussing the Summer of Love, San Francisco gatherings of 1967, and how they came at a, a point in uh, American history and Western history which was, which was highly politically charged. You had civil rights uh, marches and clashes with police, and, and you had the Vietnam War, which was this brutal war of, of oppression, uh, which a, a, a large group of people stood up against. And ar around that time, the development of LSD as a, a, a drug of choice of that movement um, seemed to coincide. Now, governments... Throughout, I mean, we, we've, we've discussed in the past, or, or has been discussed in the past, how governments have, have, have um, brought in uh, anti-drug laws to suppress for political reasons and also for racial reasons. The, 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 the um, prohibition of, of cannabis in America in the, in the 30s onwards was a way of, uh, it's been accepted as a way of marginalizing the Mexican communities at the time. And in the 60s, the... Um, LSD was, was a way of, uh, or, or the illegalization of, or, or prohibition of LSD was a way of suppressing those movements of the time, who were, uh, and a lot of people were, were put in prison and otherwise um, demonized or separated. The whole concept of free love of the, the, the late 60s and the hippie counterculture was largely ridiculed by the end of 67. So you had a, a, a long period of suppression, not only of, of uh, the cultural movements throughout the 70s, which were linked to uh, use of LSD particularly, and also cannabis, but you also had a suppression of the scientific research. And, and that went on for about, let's say, through the 70s until the mid-80s, until the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies was formed. Now, um, I'm pretty much most, I would assume, most people here are aware of, of how that was formed, Rick Doblin, and um, how they distanced themselves uh, specifically from the political elements, that the likes of Tim, of Tim Leary, the likes of Terence McKenna, because they felt that was too politically charged and they wanted to focus on the science. So they started a whole uh, ream of research which went on, which has gone on for, for 30 years now, which has slowly built a scientific case for um, uh, the use of these specific chemicals, psychedelics, um, uh, MDMA, in medical settings. Now, this has been a relative success, and the media have started to, uh, to respond to that. But what has, in separating the political aspects of, of, of the use of these substances, in separating the fact that substances such as um, LSD and MDMA do dissolve opinion structures and do make people challenge uh, systems of thought and authority, conventions and axioms of how governments uh, assemble themselves, uh, uh, what, what, is, what is they've been able to do is gain limited approval within that field, the scientific field. I'm concerned, or have been since I went to the first talk in well, exploring consciousness in 2004, that in making the case for medicalization of these substances, um, the, there is a kind of elephant in the room, which I, I was at the press conference at the start of this, this um, conference, and uh, they, they had, for the first time, an assembl assemblage of uh, mainstream journalists from The Guardian, from the, the New Statesman, The Sun even, and they were all wanted to know, understand the science and uh, respond to the developments in science, but there was a sense of a, a elephant in the room that even though Rick Doblin, etc., cetera, were dressed in suits, uh, essentially, they had a, an element of that, that hippie mentality. What would come next if we if we if we legalise on a, on a broader level? So, I think it's been you know I, I, it's, it's an awkward situation because I don't want to undermine obviously this case of scientific uh, research and if it, if it's tainted with the political side, which is you know we live in a, in a very heightened political moment. To, to reference back to Ali's first talk, you see, and I, I feel this is because what I often do is sit in the background and want to ask these questions and, and, and chat. So really, that's I found my space to just have a little rant. So I hope you bear with me in that. Um, 
And my, my attitude, I've had various discussions over this idea of postmodernism and uh, psych psychedelics. I feel psychedelics are postmodern. I think we've lived in these structured, ossified systems of authoritarian control. Let's just even call it Anglo-American empire of the past 400 years, which has intensified in the past 50 years. And I think the discovery of psychedelics post-war and the development through the 60s and the discovery of MDMA in the 80s, which I think was a heightened political moment. Many cultures are coming together in the UK and these outdoor raves were basically a public assembly, a totally spontaneous public assembly of people from all walks of life, from all racial backgrounds. You know, essentially we have to acknowledge, and I was at the, I was at the talk yesterday on diversity, this, this also elephant in the room, which is white male privilege and how that also assumed a certain control which exists within science of a certain authority of how things are perceived, what we deem acceptable, unacceptable. Those break down in cultural movements. So they broke down in the 60s, they broke down in the 80s, hence the government brought in the Criminal Justice Bill, which essentially was, in 1994, was a ban on assemblies of more than 100 people using uh, a medium of repetitive beats. So automatically what you're doing is you're creating a, a context for which you can arrest people for public assembly and obviously music is central to this. Now that, that more or less you know, dissipated and diminished over the, the 2000s, well over the, sorry, the late 90s. By 2001 and we've had the, the Iraq war and we have, uh, well sorry, 9-11 and the Afghanistan invasion of the Iraq war and an anti-war movement building up. I would argue that by then already drugs are not in the, in the public for, but is essentially part of the, the general assembly of people in either political groups or non-political groups, although raves and super clubs, you know, develop in that time as well. And it's kind of official on one level, the, the gathering of groups still for political events has an element of um, um, drug use, although that's not to the fore. So I'm tentative of trying to bring politics into the activist space and the science, science space. But I'm wondering whether in the cultural sphere, where these discussions about postmodernism, for example, what do we mean by identity? You know, all of these, all of these issues that break down when, when one takes psychedelics can be approached perhaps from an academic level. So I'm seeing the science developing and I'm wondering possibly if the cultural humanities could find some way of making a presentation where this could be researched at a more group level. So that rather than one big smash the state, we're starting to question assumptions on which our society or civilization is built. So um, for me, postmodernism does that. It's a very broad term and there are many different authors and I, I can't pretend to have read the authors, although I did study cultural theory at university, but Foucault, Derrida, and more modern uh, speakers, someone like Mark Curtis, although would never consider himself a postmodernist, is someone who's challenging those systems of, of oppression, saying, why, why does this exist? What is the historical background of this? And I think what happens, the pushback for postmodernism and, and, and psychedelics is when people feel their comfort zone challenged. So whether that's uh, systems, institutional systems, which do not want to be challenged in academia, or, you know, privileged white men in, in the kind of psychedelic sphere. If, if it doesn't change our society collectively, if we're just hanging out on a, a hedonistic tip, which, which, which can be also something, um, but I don't think it's going to make that kind of uh, uh, um, mainstreaming, which Rick Doblin talks about. So the, Rick Doblin is, has, spo has spoken kind of demeaningly about the counterculture. He acknowledges that the counterculture was really important to psychedelic development, that that, that was intrinsic. But he, he suggests that um, um, polarizing it in those terms risks unnecessarily cha challenging the state to respond or react. So he would rather see in terms of mainstream and, and, and accepting that these uh, Substances will, will go through medical approval and then will be used in specific designated areas and that slowly that seeps into the culture. And that's a very positive, optimistic view. I would argue that it, what it does, it reinforces the systems that already exist in the medical model. I, uh, Mark Curtis, who's a, a, a writer who discusses this, discusses the, the, the issue of mental health being treated as a, a specific 
individual case for the for the for the person to be who's pathologized, told that it does not fit into the society, is given either counselling or a set of uh, you know substances, even psychedelic substances, is made right and then is placed back into that society, which we are beginning to acknowledge is dysfunctional. I think most people would agree. I think there's a pushback from those who, in some sense, identify or want to. Uh, remain in this bubble, this even nostalgic bubble of some past where everything was simple and straightforward and men were men and women were women and everyone knew where their, their place. I think all of that is, is in flux at the moment. And I feel that those of us who have the experience of the psychedelic realm and how to navigate and negotiate through those, those, those up and down elements where you can't quite work out what is real and what is not, are in this moment charged with using those skills in the everyday world as we gather in groups to say, what are we going to do with this now? What can we do with this? And wh whether we can have those difficult, traumatic sometimes and re-traumatizing conversations about the use, about, about how we feel about ourselves and our identities. So ab about a month ago, six weeks ago, I treated myself to a 50th birthday present with very fortunately able to get to San Francisco to, um, to the MAPS conference, and it is a fortunate thing. It does require an element of privilege, even if that's economic and financial privilege. First time I've been to America, and I really wanted to see San Francisco, and this conference was in Oakland. I'll just tell a little story about this, because it fascinated me that this happened. I'd, I'd gone along to, the, to the, this amazing... You know, it's like, it's, it's like this conference, it, you know, American, it's ten times bigger, everything, they've got an app, and it was all really sophisticated and brilliant. Um, they had this big hall where all the artwork was on the visionary artwork, some of it selling for $28,000. And I was looking at some of the, the tribal, tribal clothing, and I was thinking how stylized it all is and how fantastic it looks, and again, 700-pound calf jacket. <laughs> and things like that. And I, and I started to feel kind of out of place. You know, is this just a little toy now? You know, because CEOs going to Burning Man and, and having that ecstatic experience and going back and being CEOs of a petrol company or something like that. And, and I walked around and there was, which is why I was so happy to see that it was, the, that Amy organised it here, but there was a diversity panel, a, pa a panel on such issues as cultural appropriation. And these are, these are difficult discussions, but there were, it, it was a brilliant afternoon, again, of discussions on these themes. One of, one of the, the speakers was a woman who... It's the first time she'd been to a psychedelic conference. Um, she was a Native American woman, or a First Nation woman, as she, as she would prefer to be described, of Apache heritage. And she'd worked with peyote. Her, her ancestral line is to do with working with peyote as a sacred medicine. And she spoke, is it, how many people are aware of Gabo Mate's work? I mean, Gabo Mate is well known, and also well known to this woman who was a social worker, had been working for 20 or 30 years, been the first woman in her family to, to go through the, the um, academic system and become a qualified social, um, social worker. And she asked, uh, there was a discussion about, about uh, indigenous communities and the ayahuasca communities in the South, in South America, losing their, um, their, their um, environment uh, because, of, because of deforestation, etc., and colonial involvement, and also because of ayahuasca tourism. And she asked, what can be done? And um, sadly, at that moment, these are one of these things that can happen, flashpoints, but Gabo Mate was at the point of leaving, and he gave quite a flippant answer in the sense that he said, there's not really much that can happen, that, that, that can be done, this is kind of happening, and we just have to take these... These, these medicines and accept them for what they are and make the most of it kind of thing. Um, she was quite upset at this. And he did then say, and these are techniques, he said to her, you, you're obviously dealing with a lot of trauma. You need to really work with that trauma before coming back and really making this point. She got up and walked out. It was quite a big issue that had happened in that moment. And what she felt that she'd been, she said, and she was given a platform to speak, as many of the, the, the persons of, of colour were given a, a platform to speak from ayahuasca shaman who felt uh, uh, deeply that there'd been a lot of cultural appropriation and not an acknowledgement or a space for his voice to be heard. There was a lot of talk of ayahuasca as a technology, which is the scientific terminology of seeing it as a technology that can be used and taken away. And, that, and, and that's a discussion to be had. But to have that discussion and not acknowledge, as was, I thought that was brilliant, the diversity, the, the um, um, Heronimo, 
who made this issue about what's important and unimportant. So to someone who possibly is just delving into various um, um, rituals and grabbing little bits and pieces, maybe it's not considered important to that Western tourist. I mean, it may well be really important, in which case it's something that I would call cultural borrowing rather than cultural appropriation. But if it's not, then it's, it's unimportant. It's just grabbed and used as a fashion accessory and it can undermine those in that culture who feel it's, it is very important. So these are political issues to be discussed. I think that's the personal that is political. And we need to create forums where that can happen. And so, you know, right now, to, what comes to mind, and to use a cliche, but, that, but you know, even, even maybe a racist cliche, but it exists culturally. The idea of the peace pipe, the idea of the circle, I think it's replicated a lot in New Age circles and very easily demeaned, but that concept of people coming together in a circle and revealing that part of themselves from the heart, we live in a very um, systemized culture in the West. The Western mindset, the scientific mindset, is very rational-based, is what can be kind of understood, defined in very distinct margins. And when we're really talking about the, the, the personal uh, and what, what makes us feel validated or not validated, how we feel welcomed or not welcomed. These are discussions to be had, I think, in a more open, open environment, where we're perhaps in, in circles or perhaps in, in, in uh, level spaces where there is no hierarchy of one person speaking with ex expertise. I mean, I think that's important. There's no doubt the scientific and academic speakers have their place. That is the system that we've developed knowledge over the past 400 years. That is West, you know, you could call it science in general, but it's, it is a specific type of Western uh, science and methodology, which, which does merit critique, but it, uh, it has to be done with acknowledgement of its, its systemic power at the moment. And I think this is why, for me, psychedelics remain illegal, drugs remain illegal, more than any science case. The science case is as good as solid, and yet we still see these responses. I was at Charlotte Walsh's talk this morning and how, how the government has amended and adapted its uh, psychoactive law to cover a wide variety now of substances and analogues which were bypassing the laws and also bypassing the laws of harm, because now the science is coming in that these are not actually, their relative harms are quite minimal. So there's some other catch. Because there's a feeling, if groups are forming and, and experiencing these states collectively, that can develop into, into a, a, a political force. And I'm not saying that, I'm not talking about just drug taking, I'm talking about as part of cultural attributes. So hence I understand why certain activist groups don't want to make a highlight of the drug taking because that's an easy excuse if someone is a, a radical left uh, you know activist or environmental activist you don't want to make a big a big issue of your drug taking although I would rather that that was removed so that's not the issue and then we can have a bigger deeper debate about the the politics behind structural inequalities behind environmental issues all of these things are connected they're all interweave and yeah, I'd sooner have those debates in person rather than online where we can almost fall out over minor disagreements and whether postmodernism is a, is a positive force or a negative force. So how long have I been speaking? Okay. I mean, does anyone want to ask anything or want to open a discussion to anything? Yeah. Yeah, well, to what extent do you think the coexistence of political action and hedonistic drug use in this country mm -hmm. has actually undermined the political um, focus of the movement. Yeah. I'm speaking because some of my friends went over to Seattle and found that there was no coexistence of hedonistic drugs mm -hmm. and politics, and they didn't understand this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think those groupings, and you can call that again loosely kind of sexual right. liberation of the also, which challenge pre-existing moral Puritan frameworks. I think the temperance movement, et cetera, in the, in the Victorian era, I think there's always elements of that within government country, which is a moral fear of permissiveness, of sexual license, you know, license and, and, and expression. That undermines even movement, you know, below the hip from the 60s. You know, that's seen as, 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 as overtly sexual. And that's, that, there's a, there's a, I think there's a still a deeper primal terror of that, which is, which is a, a kind of Christian morality, but can also be other, you know, organized, and organized religions. But there's no doubt that that can also be destructive. So it, as with alcohol, as with drugs, any kind of excessive use, if there's an underlying trauma, whether that's sexual trauma or whether it, that, that's, uh, you know, some other kind of trauma, then that's going to be exacerbated by the use. But I think in and of itself, this idea of, of a freer expression 
you know, um, whether it's sexual, sexuality, gender, all of these, these, these are, are in flux. And I think that that unsettles certain more conservative elements in, in our society, which I think are more religious based than maybe they'd like to admit. Yeah. John. <laughs> yeah, um, so as you indicated, around the late 60s, we get this kind of, apart from police repression, we have it anywhere, kind of natural bifurcation where people are defining themselves as either changing themselves, following a more spiritual transformation, or challenging the external society. I mean, do you think we're moving into a phase where these are again beginning to again, come yeah. together? I think that all of those elements have their two sides. So individuality can also be self-actualization and it can flip back into narcissism. And so at the same time, you know, trying to affect external change can be something really powerful and really binding, and at the same time can be a, a, a kind of displacement of your own personal trauma. And so in each time we get caught in these arguments, you can pick out the one that you want to suit your argument. If you want to trash somebody or gaslight someone, which is, I think is a really big term to use in the psychedelic community and in the psychological communities, this idea of making someone feel that if they have an alternative belief that's challenging, that they're wrong, that there's something wrong with them on the personal, they need to go away and work on their trauma, like happened to this Lisana. She was told she had to work on her trauma. Well, she did have trauma. She didn't want to need to acknowledge it at that moment. Mm -hmm. At that moment, she had something to say, and she needed that to be acknowledged. And it, in, in an ideal world, that would happen loosely. In the end, it was sorted. You know, Gabo Mate apologized. There was a conversation. So I think that we have to deal with both on both levels. So both personal development, but not use that as an excuse to, hey man, it's all inside, you work on your inside, and the, the outside will magically manifest and get, which is such a diversionary tactic used in spirituality, new age, and psychedelics so often, and we need to start to break that down, challenge it. Yeah.